Hello, I'm Ellie from Kent Libraries and I'm with Liz from Kent Archives. Welcome to our discussion, which is part of this year's Kent Libraries Registration and Archives celebration of this year's LGBTQ plus History Month. The theme this year is politics in art, and we're going to be talking about the world's first lesbian film, Machen in Uniform. The film tells the story of a 14 and a half year old Manuelo von Meinhardis, who goes to a strict and repressive Potsdam boarding school where she falls in love with her teacher, Fräulein von Bernberg, who returns her feelings. Manuela stars as Don Carlos in the school play, but when she accidentally gets drunk and declares her love at the party afterwards, the headmistress is scandalised and things suddenly become very dark. Can I just say apologies to any uh, fluent German speakers for any mispronunciation? So, Liz, please can you set the scene? We're going to talk about the film Machen in Uniform, but I believe it started as a play? Yes, that's right, Ellie. Um, the play actually opened almost a year before the film in November 1930 in Leipzig. And at that, that stage, it, it went through several name changes. At that stage, it was called Ritterneristan which is the night Neristan, and that's quite a strange title, but it's actually the character that Manuela plays in the play within the play, which in, in this instance, <laughs> it's confusing, isn't it? Was, it is rather. <laughs> it is. Um, so that was actually not Schiller's Don Carlos, as it is in the film, but a play by Voltaire called Zayer. So in, in this production, Herta Tila, whom we'll be hearing a lot about, and who actually played Manuela in the film, was also Manuela. But Fräulein von Bernberg was played by an older actress called Claire Harden or Claire Harton. And Herta, I should say, is, is one of our main sources of information about both the play and the film. She actually gave an interview about it in 1980, from, from which a lot of our knowledge comes. And what she says about this production is actually rather interesting. So she says, Harden was somewhat frumpish, pushing 50, no longer youthful, more a motherly type. So in this production, the problem of a lesbian relationship was more or less withdrawn. As far as Harden was concerned, it was not represented at all. And for me, the relationship was one of mother and child. So that's Herta's take on it. But what would be really interesting to know, and, and I don't think we do know, is what the script was like how much the script differed from later versions. Do you believe that the play Moving to Berlin was significant on how it was received? Um, yes, I, I think it was, because for, for one thing, there was a, a very active gay and lesbian culture in Berlin. So they had, I think, a different audience than the one they had in Leipzig. It was given a new title, which was Gestern and Heute, meaning yesterday and today. And there was a new director as well, who was Leontine Sargon, who later went on to direct the film. There was some new casting as well. Um, Manuela, to begin with at least, was played by Gina Falkenberg, and Fräulein von Bernberg was played by someone called Margarita Meltzer, who was a good deal younger than Claire Harden. I, th I think she's probably in her mid-twenties. And there's at least one photograph of her with Gina Falkenberg, and I don't know whether she was butch or she, she was asked to butch up for the role because she is very, very caricature butch lesbian. Um, you know, in, in fact, if you wanted to cast someone as Stephen Gordon in The Well of Loneliness, you, you could do quite well by casting Margarita Meltzer, I think. Now, Herta certainly thought that the Berlin production was much more lesbian. And Dorothea Wieck, who later on to, went on to play Fräulein von Bernberg in the film, didn't act in it, but she went to see it. And what she says is that she thought the relationship between Manuela and von Bernberg was, and it's a slightly funny phrasing, which might be to do with the translation, too strongly erotically emphasised. Yeah, so, so I think you can understand what, she, what she's getting at by that. Now, I haven't seen the, the Berlin script, and to be perfectly honest, I would, I would struggle to, to read the German even if I could. But what I have found is what claims to be a literal and faithful French translation of the original. And so I can I can pretty much get through that with my French, I think. <laughs> and certainly what, one thing that's clear is there's a lot more of what one might describe as inappropriate kissing, which we'll talk about a bit more later. 
And for ex also for another example, um, Manuela's speech when she gets gets drunk after the play and declares her love for von Bernberg is much longer. And it also contains um, a section that goes so something like this in my translation. Oh, her kiss. You don't know what it's like because she only kisses me like that. And the stage direction then says she makes a gesture of taking Fraulein von Bernberg in her arms. So sweetly, at such length, so tenderly. And there's nothing like that in the film. So how did the play progress to being made into a film? Well, we don't know when this happened, but Carl Froelich, who produced the film, or or he's called the artistic director in the, in the film titles, clearly must have seen it. And then he telephoned Leontine Zargon. And we're quite lucky because she published an autobiography and she's got a couple of pages about the film in that. So she says that when he first approached her, she, she thought it was to do with an acting role and, and doesn't seem to have known what it, what it was for. But in fact, when she went to see him, it turned out that he wanted to make a film of Geston and Hoyter, as it then was, and wanted her to direct. Um, I don't think she's the most tactful of women because her reply was that she wasn't actually very interested in films and hadn't even seen very many. But nevertheless, she got the job. And I think the end result shows that she, she was a quick learner and she learned very well too. Most of the, the leads in the film were people who, who played the roles in, in the Berlin play. So I would imagine she also had quite a say in the casting, although that isn't something that we, we know for a fact. Um, and incidentally, it was Carl Froelich who came up with the that now famous title, Machen in Uniform, which is variously translated as girls in uniform, schoolgirls in uniform, and children in uniform. In, indeed, you see, I don't, I don't know whether the German sounds as dodgy as some of those English yeah, translations. Yeah, translation, sound. Indeed, yes. So is Machen in Uniform the first lesbian film to be made for general release? Um, certainly, as far as I know, there was a lesbian character, um, the Countess Augusta Geschwitz, in the 1929 silent film Pandora's Box, starring Louise Brooks. Um, but although I wouldn't say she's a minor character, but she is only a very small part of quite a long film and things don't end well for her, let's say. Machen is a much more positive film. It has, if not a happy ending, at least an open ending and none, none of the characters dies. Um, when Manuela tells Franon von Bernberg that she loves her, she's, she's not reproached for saying that she's not told her her love is wrong. It's just that von Bernberg says essentially, well, I can't show you any favoritism because if I do, then the other girls will be jealous. And when to, towards the the end, um, von Bernberg defends her to the headmistress. She she actually makes the probably if 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 Machen has a famous line, this is it when she says, um, "What you call sin, I call the great spirit of love that has a thousand forms." <laughs> very poetic <laughs> it is isn't it <laughs> um and you know the the, the way the, the girls at, at the school is por portrayed are very positive because it's it's quite accepted there, there's nothing odd in having a, a crush for Fraulein von Bernberg it's accepted that that's what most of them do and clearly some of them have crushes on each other as well so I think not just a first lesbian film but actually a very, very positive one in many ways too I believe there's no men in the film, is that right? No men at all. I think the only other film I've ever seen where that was a recommendation to me was I've Heard the Mermaids Singing in about 1987. But there, there was a much smaller cast there. So tell us more about Krista Winslow. Are there autobiographical aspects in the, well, the play, the film, the book, all of it? I, I would say very, very much so. Um, it's, it's a shame, as far as I know, Krista never left an autobiography as such. But there are certainly quite a number of facts about her life that you can you can check and you can see are in the film and the play and especially the book, actually, um, that the book is is a fuller account of Manuela's life. So it actually starts starts with her childhood and the 
account of her life at school really only to occupies about the last third of the book. Oh, and I should say um, that in, in some, some more my poor German accent is called Das Mädchen Manuela, which, which is, 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 is available in a translation, which is translated as the child Manuela. And that was published in 1933. So a, a, a little bit after the film. And interestingly, it had to be published in the Netherlands, not in Germany. So uh, Krista was born in 1888. And like Manuela, she was the daughter of a high ranking army officer. And also like Manuela, she was only 11 when her mother died. At the age of 14, she was sent to a very disciplinarian and repressive although socially very exclusive boarding school in Potsdam called the Kaiser in Augusta Stift. And that building is still there. I think it's flats now. And it's, it's the most intimidating building. When I first saw pictures of it, I thought this looks like a cross between a monastery and an asylum. And Krista, if we, we can trust what she says in the book, actually was, was so taken aback by it that she felt she'd been taken to the wrong place because she thought it just looked like an army barracks. So very austere, really. Yeah, really, really very austere. Because I think also like Manuela, she was a sensitive girl and it was a real shock to her. And also I think she was lonely, very, very bewildered by by the whole array of rules and you know, all, all the things that were forbidden and for you know for no no obvious reason really, apart from perhaps it would have made their lives a little bit easier, you know, to, to have more to eat, to be able to read their own books to have a bit of pocket money and all this kind of thing. And she she was still grieving for her mother, I think in desperate need, need of affection. You know, we probably hadn't had enough love at home, to be honest, since, since her mother died. And it was, a, it was a very odd kind of school, really, very particular kind of school. And I'm, I have, have tried to think if there might be anything roughly equivalent among English girls' schools, and to be, be perfectly honest, I can't. It was like a cadet corps for girls. And so it's run on strictly Prussian lines, high, very highly disciplined, even militaristic. And any show of emotion at all was firmly discouraged. And I'd, I'd be really surprised if these girls were encouraged to think of careers. I, I think they were purely being educated so that when they grew up, they would, they would marry other high ranking soldiers and be the mother of soldiers. And that was that was it. So her father was a, a high ranking Prussian he, officer. He, he was, yeah, which is, which is interesting because actually he was born in Scotland of English parentage. But yes, he was a high, he was a high ranking officer in the German army. Didn't know that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think as far as, far as one can see, you know, most most of the the teachers, if if they didn't actively sign up to that ethos, enforced it. But there there was one teacher who was different, who was very kind to the girls. And I, you know, I think think she must almost from the beginning have, have won Krista's heart, and Krista fell in love with her. Now this is this is where I have to start doing a, a bit of guessing because I, I I don't think now it's possible to find out exactly what did happen. So my guess is that somehow Krista's love for this woman became public, and that there was some kind of serious fallout from it, because really, really the only direct quote she has about it is to say, or to rather to talk about the adored teacher who was with us for so short a time and who was possibly forced to leave because of my tragic love for her. So I think first that sounds as if the woman lost her job and also that Krista believed, regardless of what the truth was, that she was at least partly responsible for that. And I think the, the other thing we can fairly conclude is that they, ne they never had any contact later when Krista was an adult, because I, I think that if they had done, they would certainly have talked about what happened. And, you know, and if the woman was was as kind as Krista thought and it hadn't been Krista's fault, she would have reassured her on that. Now, Liz, I am trying to follow the timeline. So when would Krista have been at school? OK, so um, she, she went, she was, when she, when she was 14, I, I think the exact dates are between Easter 1903 and mm. Easter 1905. So actually, yeah, that's that's one very significant difference because when she 
wrote the play and when the film was produced, they actually have their contemporary 1930 or 1931 setting. But actually, if it's, it's interesting to think of the timeline. So, so this is, so when, when the film comes out, this is getting on for 30 years later. Mm. And, I, and I think at, at that time, she, she was still haunted by what had happened to her. And cer certainly she talks about still having nightmares about that school when she was in her early 40s, which I, th I think is quite shocking that someone can have been so traumatised, you know, which, which she clearly was. And she, she talked to Herta about it and Herta says that Krista told her that it was something that she had to write from her heart. So I don't know whether it did act as therapy for her. One, one hopes it might have done, but... You know, so, so something something that's wounded her that deeply. You just don't know, do you? I suppose it was all sort of mixed up with her mother's death as well. So, yeah, yeah I, I, it I probably think went very deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Sadly, and this is this is one of my my real regrets for things we don't know. We we don't know what the name of the woman on whom von Bernberg was based was. Um, Although, although I think we, we have a, a fairly good idea of what, what she was like as a human being and, and also a very good idea of what she looked like as well from the descriptions in the play and in the book. And I'm also fairly sure that Krista, who was actually a, an artist, a sculptor, before she became a writer, would have been able, if you had asked her, to draw this woman or, or, or to sculpt her from, from memory. Because in the book, there's a very long and detailed description of what she looked like and it stands out because none of the other characters have that length and detail of description so so I, I think she just she just had the vision of her in her mind's eye and wrote down what she saw in her mind's eye after all that time in the in the book she she gives von Bernberg some some backstory and you get some some insight even more than in the film in, into what she's feeling and so, so Krista says that she returned Manuela's love boundlessly with all the strength of her heart, although she dared not contemplate anything but self-discipline and renunciation, which, which is interesting because I think a lot of that does actually come over in the film. Mm. I mean, whether, whether any of that had any basis in fact, who knows? But it, it does seem that Krista was quite convinced that her love was returned, whether or not that was shown. Do we know how Dorothea Veek was chosen for one of the lead roles? Um, yes, we do. And, it, and it's rather interesting, actually. Actually, both she and Herta were 23 at the time. And although she was only 23, she was already quite experienced as both a stage and a film actress. But she hadn't, hadn't acted in either Ritter, Neristan or Gestern and Hoyter, so she'd had no, no direct involvement with the play up until that time. Now, Carl Froelich and I, I don't know how, because I don't think, don't think her family had any sort of acting background generally. But anyway, he, he somehow knew her family slightly and was aware that she acted. But for some, some bizarre reason, and until that time in films, she'd had to wear a blonde wig, although actually she, she naturally had very dark brown hair. Dark brown hair and luminous blue eyes, I think it was. And so Carl, Carl Froelich went to, went to visit her family and was shown a photograph of her from, from which he then realised that she had dark hair. And as a result of the photograph, he invited her for a screen test. And that I think is quite interesting because it suggests that he was not just wanting someone who's a good actor, but somebody who looked a particular way for the role of von Bernberg. So she went, did her screen test and I think it didn't go very well because she, she actually felt she'd failed the screen test. But they kept the cameras rolling. And after what she thought was the screen test, I think something like Carl Froelich asked her how she would approach the role of the teacher if she got it. And something that she said, or possibly he gave her a scenario and she acted it. But something, something that she did or said after the actual screen test convinced him that she was right for the role. And she got it. And again, that's something I wish we knew. I'll be sure a few more details of what she what she actually did then, because in many ways, I, I would have thought her casting was was quite risky because she had no background in having acted in the in the play. And in, 
I, I think you, you can actually argue that, that that role is the most important in the film. And if she hadn't been able to do it, I think the film would undoubtedly have failed. So talking about the kiss, the scene with the kiss does seem particularly daring. I think you can fairly say that and I, I have to admit that the first time I, I ever saw it which was in, in one of the fangirl edits so I didn't even see it in the context of the film the first time I, I was rather shocked by it and I thought now surely they've done some extra editing there haven't they and then I saw it in the film and I thought no they haven't done any, any extra editing that is how it is in the film the particularly disturbing thing is that it's a kiss between a, a woman in her late 20s, probably, um, and a 14 year old girl who is also her pupil. Um, although I have to say, I'm, I'm not seeing any comment on that in, in 1930s reviews. So, so that seems not to have disturbed them too much. But there, there are records of very strong reactions to that kiss by contemporary audiences, which you can well imagine might have been the case. And so von Bernberg kisses Manuela on the lips. And although by modern standards, it, it is quite a chaste kiss, it's also quite definitely an erotic kiss. And the way that it's presented is, is as a romantic consummation, because there, there's actually quite, quite a long lead up to, to the kiss probably about a, a couple of minutes where von Bernberg walks, walks around the dormitory and kisses all the other girls on the forehead. And the, the music is, is really building to a climax. <laughs> and and by, by, by the time that she comes to, to Manuela, I mean, the, the music is, is going berserk and you think this really wouldn't be out of place in something like Gone with the Wind for a kiss between Scarlet and Rhett. You know, is, is it, that is how it, how it is presented. And it's only recently that I realised when, when I was reading someone else's comment on the film that you can actually see that it's been cut. So originally it was a more lingering kiss. And unfortunately, what, what, certainly what I don't know is whether that more lingering kiss was ever shown on the cinema. You know, all, all, all that we know is that audiences had a strong reaction to it. And what I, I do find quite, quite hard to believe is that both Herta Tila and Dorotea V really struggled to film that scene. I have read that there was a similar goodnight kissing ritual in some English girls boarding schools, but I very, doubt, very much doubt that it had that sort of erotic charge that you see in Machen in uniform. <laughs> <laughs> How was the film promoted and was the lesbian aspect played down? Well, the word lesbian is never mentioned, but then, to be honest, I'm not sure that you would expect it to be in 1931, even, even in a German film. And if, if you read the contemporary criticism, mostly they, they actually see it very much as a love story. But although Manuela's feelings for von Bernberg are, are very, very clear, very apparent, some of the reviewers, and therefore presumably some of the people watching the film as well, so felt that von Bernberg's feelings for her were much more ambiguous. Um, I'm not sure that I agree with that myself, but I, you know, I think there actually is room for interpreting those feelings in, in different ways. However, there was a Berlin lesbian magazine called The Girlfriend who, who gave the film an extensive review and they had no doubt at all that von Bernberg was a lesbian and they I very much admired Dorothea Wieck's portrayal of her and what they described as the conflict between her self-control and her nature. Um, I believe some scenes were added to the film which weren't in the play. Can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there's, there, there are quite, quite a lot of differences, actually. And I suppose in, in general terms, one difference, and I suppose if, if I knew more about a film, this would have been quite obvious to me, is that you can actually see the feelings of the two lead characters and their reactions to each other in a way that you you know you just can't can't see in the play. So so that that is it's probably an obvious difference, but it's, it's a very very significant one I think. There are also quite quite a number of scenes which while they don't move the central story forward, 
actually do a lot to fill out the background, amplify some of the scenes that are in the play and give you a much fuller idea of what the girls' lives are like. Um, there's one of them getting ready for bed and they're shown in various stages of undress, which are very decorous stages of undress by modern standards. But I wonder if that was perhaps a bit more daring in 1931, whether possibly Carl Froelich even put that in, um, intending to appeal to a male audience. And there are just, just sort of one or two other little touches throughout the film that I think may, may have been put in for the same sort of motivation. But there are other scenes as, as well that, that are, I, I think are actually really interesting in amplifying the characters and what's going on with them. Probably one of my favourite additional scenes is the staff meeting. And I'm so glad I've never had to attend a staff meeting like that. Um, be, because the, f the first thing that is interesting is that you very soon become aware what an outsider von Bernberg is among her colleagues. Um, her philosophy of education is very different. She very much believes in being a friend to the girls and then treating them with kindness, even with love. Whereas her colleagues are much, much more concerned with maintaining strict discipline. And they also use the meeting to score points off each other and to get in Frau Oberin's good books. And on a number of occasions, that's actually done at von Bernberg's expense. But then when you look at the way that she interacts with her colleagues, you see that to a large extent, that's, she's actually bringing that on herself because she's very offhand with them. And al although she defends her, her methods assertively, not to say aggressively, she's also very arrogant. And there's a moment when Fraulein von Kesten, who is the headmistress's deputy, points out that Manuela isn't doing very well in von Bernberg's classes. And von Bernberg, who up to that point has, has been very confident in her defence of herself, um, clearly doesn't know what to say to that and says very, very, very lamely, oh, but that will change. You think, well, possibly, but the problem I would say it's clearly that she, she knows what's wrong with Manuela, that Manuela's in love with her. And therefore, when she's in classes, she, she's just so distracted that, that she, she forgets everything she's learned. And we actually then see that demonstrated in the next scene when we are in von Bernberg's class. Um, she, she teaches scripture. And first of all, we see Manuela looking at von Bernberg with, with such intense longing that von Bernberg is clearly disturbed by this. And after a while, she, she can't meet Manuela's eyes and she has to look away. But then Manuela is actually called on to, to recite the lesson that she's learned. And she begins quite well, but then, then suddenly she, she's clearly very distracted. And obviously everything she's ever learned has just, just flown out of her head and she can't go on. Um, von Bernberg clearly passionately wants her to do well and she just can't do it. So von Bernberg says really quite sternly, I'm prepared again. And that's it, poor, poor Manuela. However, the, the biggest and most significant difference is in how the film ends, which is quite different from both the play and the book. And I think pro probably I just, just need to, to, to give the context a little bit, because we said at the beginning, didn't we, that, that suddenly, the whole tone of the film changes and and it be becomes very dark because Frau Oberyn is, is so scandalised by Manuela's behaviour. And I, it's crystal clear in the book and I think fairly clear in the film that Frau Oberyn thinks that Manuela um, has declared a lesbian love for Fraulein von Bernberg. And not only that she should be punished, but really the girls shouldn't be and I want, want to put this in inverted commas, infected. So she decides that Manuela should be separated from von Bernberg and also isolated from the other girls. And Manuela encounters von Bernberg and, and is clearly very, very distressed by all this. And von Bernberg is moved by her distress and thinks that actually Manuela is going to be better off if she tells her what her punishment is. But Actually, I would say that that, that is a, a mistake on her part because Manuela then just feels that she's being rejected by her. 
you know, but rejected by this woman she, she loves so passionately. And she despairs. And so she tries to kill herself. But in the film, the girls actually intervene and they save her. Whereas in the play and in the book, she dies. And, you know, that's, that's just so significant. But there, there's, there seems to be a bit of a difference of opinion about why that change happened. Herta Teela says that the Manuela's suicide actually was filmed, but that it just didn't look right. And so it was decided to change the ending. Leontine Zargan, and this isn't in her autobiography, this is in an interview she gave just a couple of years after the film was made, says something quite different. Um, she says that the young actors playing the girls became so wholeheartedly involved in Manuela's story and so distressed by what was happening to her that it just felt wrong that she should die. And you know, the, the whole change is, is just really, really interesting because critics commented very positively on the anti-authoritarianism of the film. But really, the, the reason that it's anti-authoritarian is because the girls stand up to Frau Oberyn, the headmistress, and save Manuela. So it's, it's that whole changed ending that gives it that, that anti-authoritarian flavour. Interesting, because I thought perhaps it had been changed because they thought the audiences wouldn't be able to cope. But it seems that's not the reason. Well, I, I, I don't think so. And in fact, I've, I've never seen it. Um, but supposedly there was an alternative ending with the suicide, which was the version that, because I think it, it wasn't immediately banned in Nazi Germany, but I think, or I have read, that the version with the suicide was the one that was first shown in Nazi Germany. Very interesting. Yeah. So how was the film funded and how long did it take to make? Uh, well, the, the way in, the, in which the film was funded was, was, I think, quite innovative because instead of taking their salary as they would do normally, everyone involved only took a, a fraction of what they would usually have, have been paid, I think possibly something like a quarter. And then the idea was that they would have a share in the profits of the film. Now, the, the film only cost 55,000 marks to make, although it had a shooting budget of 220,000 marks. And, and Herta her is our source for all this, and she says that by the end of 1934, it had made 6 million marks. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. So you would think, wouldn't you, they would have been coining it. But no, they, they never saw any of that money. And I, yeah, I don't think anybody knows for certain what happened. For a time that there was a rumour that the distributor had taken the money and the distributor was Jewish. So you tend to think that in Nazi Germany that that was probably the reason for that rumour. But Herter actually met him in 1937, um, by which time she was pretty penniless and so was he. So it wasn't him. Leontine Zagen thought it was Karl Froelich. We don't know for sure. But it... it just seems you know so unfair. It was such a successful film, and they they never saw a penny of that money. Now the, the the film was made in what I think is a remarkably quick time. There were two weeks of rehearsals, which which took place at Leontine Sargon's Berlin fat, flat, and I assume they only needed two weeks because most of them had had played the roles in Berlin. You know, both very, very familiar with the, the parts they were playing, and I guess just needed to get up to speed a bit with the extra scenes. And then the filming itself, the shooting, took about three weeks. And unfortunately, I don't have anything to compare with. I, I don't know what the usual length of time for, for making a film in 1931 was. But to me, that, that all sounds remarkably quick. Do we know where it was filmed? Um, yes, we do, actually. Most of the interiors, including that really high, frighteningly vertiginous staircase were in something that was called the Great Military Orphanage at Potsdam. So it was fil filmed in Potsdam, but not, not, not in the um, Kaiserin Augusta Stift. Although I, I think Leontine Sargon went there for background and said, but instead of admitting what she was doing, said, oh, my, my niece is coming from South Africa. I need to find a good school for her. We don't know for a fact that it was Kaiserin Augusta Stift, 
but um, she says that it was the most exclusive school in Potsdam that she went to. But then she, she, you know, I think so. So she wanted something that would be very much like it in terms of being um, a very forbidding place. But Manuela's suicide in in the play is off screen, and and I think it's that she she jumps from a window. But when Leontine Sargon saw, saw this staircase, you know, she she thought that it would it would really suit for staging Paul Manuela's suicide attempt. But also she actually uses that, that staircase really, really cleverly. A, a, a lot of important things that, that happen in other ways in the play actually happen on that staircase. And I should say, because I hope to do this when things are properly normal, you can actually go and stay in that building now. It's a hotel. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so was the film popular with the public as well as the reviewers? You've mentioned the reviewers as we've gone along. Oh, I, I, I think definitely so. In fact, I, I think it was probably the first cult film and, you know, cult, cult film in a good way, not like Edward, it's so bad, it's good, but in a really, really good and positive way. Um, Herta Tila and Dorothea Veek were deluged with fan mail, most of it from women. And, you know, I think it's probably fair to say that for a short time they had the film world at their feet. You know, they, they really, really did. But the, the timing was just so awful because the film had its premiere in Berlin on the 27th of November, 1931. And of course, in 1933, January, Hitler came to power. And subsequently, the film was banned in Germany, although I'm not sure whether that was because of the lesbian element or because of the anti-authoritarianism, although it was anti-Prussian and not anti-Nazi, or whether it was both, or indeed, whether because there are quite a number of Jewish people involved in the making of it. Probably all of it, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I would so, in which other countries was the film shown, and how was it received there? Well, I think it was a huge hit wherever it was shown. Um, it was first shown in England in February 1932 at the Film Society in London, and that, that I think, was a was a private viewing. And it either had no subtitles or very elementary subtitles. But then later in 1932, it was shown more widely in London cinemas. And then in 1933, it, it went out to the provinces. It was well received in France. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and in Mexico. And in fact, in 1951, there was a Mexican remake, which is a very bizarre film with, with a I, th I think it's, it's, it's the way Krista Winslow would probably have written it had she been a Catholic on some hard drugs. It's very bizarre. Um, and the film even won your description. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the film, there, there was a, a whole cult for it in Japan too, and it actually won award, an award in Japan. And according to Herta, the distributor in Romania wrote and asked for another 20 metres of kissing to be inserted in the film. Though sadly, we, we have no more details about quite who kissing whom and in what context. Uh, the French absolutely loved it. The subtitles for, for the French release were written by Colette, of all people. Gosh, yeah. yeah. And, and she, I think, insisted on see, seeing the film first and was very impressed with it and felt that it, you know, it was a much, much more authentic film than it would have been had it been made in Hollywood. And I've seen lots of references to it and articles about it in French film magazines. And I, I think I'm quite, quite obsessed with it. And there's a, it's a very interesting interview um, that was done in 1933 when the, the, the French journalist went to interview Dorothea Vick, who I think at, the, at that time was, was still in Berlin. And it's quite clear that this French woman has a huge crush on her. She really has. <laughs> So what happened in the US? Um, was it censored at all there? Well, I think that originally the Americans wanted to ban it. And apparently this was only prevented by the direct intervention of Eleanor Roosevelt. 1932, the New York Board of Film Censors agreed to pass a version of it, provided a number of cuts were made. And the list of the cuts they wanted is, is really quite amazing. So we've got 
All views of Manuela's face as she looks at Fräulein von Bernberg in the classroom. Manuela's confession to von Bernberg that she wants to come to her at night. Manuela's declaration to her classmates after the play of her love for von Bernberg. Von Bernberg's defence of her affectionate attitude to the schoolgirls. Frau Oberin's commanding von Bernberg not to speak to Manuela. Scene in which Manuela clings to von Bernberg's skirt. Von Bernberg's admonishment to Manuela, you should not like me so much. And actually, I think that's a mistranslation. I think what she says is you should not love me so much. And finally, views of Manuela's face registering unseemly desire. So, you know, I'm inclined to think that if all of that had been cut out, the American audience just would not have made any sense of it. And in fact, I'm really surprised that they haven't put the kiss on that list, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, quite bizarre <laughs> in a way. <laughs> it is, isn't it? I mean, but, but that, I mean, that, that would just have, there just have been so many holes in it. It just would have made no sense. But do we know how it was received once it went out with the cut? Um, I, I think moderately well received, but I, I don't think it had quite such a wide distribution as we would have expected. And I, I don't think there was quite the enthusiasm for it in America that there was in other countries. And yet I, I, I think it... I think it was relatively well known um, because in the late 1950s, um, I think she was an academic, I was an academic or a librarian, a woman called Jeanette Forster published a very, very interesting book called Sex Variant Women in Literature, which is basically lesbians in literature. And she, she has a section on Krista Winslow's novel. And she actually says, oh, I don't really need to discuss this very much because the film is so well known. And I'm assuming that she's actually referring to the 1931 original, not, not the 1958 remake, although her book was published in 1958. So, so I think it was fairly well known, but not as enthusiastically received as elsewhere. Do you think the film is as well known as it deserves to be? And I'm talking about, you know, in current day. Um, I think you're probably asking the the wrong person in, in many ways because I'm so enthusiastic about it that I always think it should be better well known as, as my poor long-suffering colleagues can attest. But having said that there has been a, a lot of academic discussion of it and also that there are a number of very enthusiastic and very very well informed fangirl websites. I, I've obtained a lot of information from them. I think it was in about March last year the British Film Institute issued it on a dual format, Blu-ray and DVD. So, so that I think will again promote it and make it much more readily available. But it is interesting that if you just search on the term machin in uniform on the internet, rather than specifying a year, you will get, I would say, an equal number of results for the 1958 remake with Lily Palmer and Romy Schneider. So much better known, I think, than it used to be because the, um, the 1994 Virago publication of Krista Winslow's novel actually has a scene from a 58 remake on the front, which I think is a little bizarre. Um, but I, I, I think it could still do to be better known. Um, I believe the film was reviewed in provincial British newspapers. Have you got any examples in Kentish newspapers? Um, well, we, we, we know for a fact that it was shown in Tunbridge Wells at the Opera House and in the Picture House at Whitstable, and that was in March and April 1933 respectively. But sadly, I, I haven't managed to find any local reviews or any letters to the papers about it. And in fact, if, if anyone ever comes across any reviews or any letters, I'd be really, really interested to learn about them. Um, is it likely that either or both, Krista Winslow and Dorothea Veek were lesbians? Oh, I think think Krista Winslow, undoubtedly. Although, interestingly, she, she was married and married for a few years too. Uh, she married a Hungarian baron called Leos Hatfany in December 1913. And they didn't divorce until 1924. I think they separated in 1922. And I have to say that that marriage really does baffle me 
And I, I can only think that perhaps her, her family were aware that she was lesbian and put pressure on her to get married. And she, she obviously gave it her best shot, I think, to be married for, for, for that length of time. But certainly by the 1930s, she, she was having relationships with women and all her subsequent relationships until the, the time of her death in 1944 were with women. And from some of the things that, well, now I was going to say from some of the things that Herta Teela says, which, which suggests that perhaps um, she's hinting, but, but she more or less says that Krista Winslow was in love with her. And Herta categorically states that Winslow was a lesbian. So I think in Krista's case, there is no doubt at all. It usually said that Dorothea Veek was heterosexual and for, for, for a long time, I, I was quite happy to, to accept that. But I'm, I'm actually not so sure, to be honest. I mean, her, her only documented relationships are, are with men and she too was married, though, though for a really quite a short time. She got married in, I think it was September 1932. And then in March 1933, she went to America without her husband. And I think she was there for the rest of 33 and part of 34. And then in 1935, she divorced him. So not quite sure what to make of that. Women undoubtedly found her attractive then and indeed still do. And I, I would say that she was a lesbian icon before that term was ever coined. Paramount did a very interesting bit of marketing for her first American film, Cradle Song. And they, they had a statement in their publicity. You will know why 10 million women have raved about Dorothea Veek when you see her in Cradle Song. Um, which strikes me as a slightly odd thing to say, um, even if the majority of film audiences were women. But there's something even odder in a review in the New York Times in 1932 of another one of her films in which she acted with her to Tila, Anna and Elizabeth. And well, I'll, I'll, I'll just read this. I think this is a very odd thing to say. Miss Feek has gone through some rough times since Machen. The producers, quite misjudging her qualities, made her play com characters completely out of her range. She wanted the conventional ways of sex appeal and coyness, and she was quite unsuccessful at it. She undoubtedly has an appeal, but there is something devious and outside the normal in it. Now, I think that what that reviewer was actually wanting to say was deviant and abnormal, but that he, and I'm fairly sure it is he, clearly felt that that would just be a bit too obvious. But I think that the implication is, is fairly clear. I mean, that, that may just be some, say something about the reviewer's taste, but equally it may say something about a reputation that she had. It, I, I just find it a very odd thing to say. So like, like Herta, as, as we've seen, she received a lot of fan mail for women, including love letters from women, which, which they both had. One thing that, that I found very surprising when I first read of it was that in spite of their on-screen chemistry, Herta and Dorothea didn't particularly get a, get along, or, or in fact, it might be more accurate to say that Herta didn't get along with Dorothea. I've not actually seen any comment by Dorothea about Herta, and Herta says that the reason for that was that she was always reserved, controlled, conveying the sense of please leave me alone, hands off. And when you consider some of their scenes together, that, that must have made their lives very difficult, I think. But then Dorothea V clearly wasn't like that with everyone because there's a photograph of her with Nina Moyes, who was the assistant director on Cradle Song, and they're holding hands. I don't know, I almost because obviously there's always a reason why somebody is please don't touch me hands off. And I almost wonder whether it was because Dorothea Far from not liking her, she was actually a bit too fond of her and um, wasn't very comfortable with that. And of course, you know, when you think even now, amazingly, the 21st century, I, I think there's always an element of risk for an actor who, who comes out as gay or lesbian. And 
you know, I, I think in... in I think and, particularly in Hollywood still, isn't it? Yeah, 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 I think there is. And, you know, I think if she was lesbian or bisexual, it, it probably would have wrecked her, her career had it been known. And of course, in 1933, the Nazis have come to power and one of the many many groups that they persecuted were lesbians and gay men you know so so if if she was lesbian it became known it could have could have landed her in a concentration camp eventually so yeah i have to say with with her i don't know but i wonder well, i think it's probably quite a good place to round up the session liz is there anything else you want to add no, I, I, I don't really think so. Only thing I, I would do is actually urge people to to watch that film because I, I think it's a it's a very very fine film and not not only for the, for the reasons that we've been discussed. I, you know, so it's just a very 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 good film. So please do go and watch it if you can. So thank you for sharing all your knowledge and enthusiasm, Liz. The good news is that the film Machen in Uniform will be available to borrow in Kent Library so check the catalogue um, you can reserve it from any library in Kent and that includes the mobile libraries and we also have lots of LGBT plus doc including ebooks from classics to recent publications and remember the books are available all year round and not just in February and for everyone not just the LGBTQ plus community so thanks again, Liz. I've yeah, enjoyed our chat. Thank you. Oh, thank you.